Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. As always, I'm your host, Simon. What happens here is uh, one of my writers today, Kevin, has written me a script. This one's called Unfavorable Semicircle. I have absolutely no idea what it's about. The format here is Kevin writes it for me. I've never read it. We explore it together. And what do we do? We decode the unknown. Such a clever name. Anyway, let's just get into it, shall we? Oh, before we do, if you're enjoying this show, please do leave it a review, or if you're watching on YouTube, hello there, uh, why not drop a like? Leave a comment. That'd be fun. Originally, my intro for this episode was going to include a bit of inside baseball about writing, or more specifically, the proofreading process for these scripts. While I have completely redone the intro, I recently learned that Simon is a huge fan of the phrase inside baseball. I'd say I'm <laughs> huge fan of the phrase. It was a phrase I learned because it's very American, and I was like, that's really it. You know, it's like uh, things that only people who are part of that group understand, like an inside joke, but not just jokes. And I was like, that's a really good term that I didn't feel there was a good British equivalent for. And so I adopted it, and I like it. So I wanted to at least leave the phrase in instead of cutting it from the second script in a row. On to the personal anecdote. My friends and I were gathered together for our weekly game of Magic the Gathering. The game was normally secondary, and we really were just hanging out and talking, having a grand old time. Oh, what was it? There was a... Uh, I was watching a TV show with my kids called Peppa Pig, which uh, is a little bit insufferable. Not as insufferable as some of the other sh** that kids watch. But um, they were describing what like adults do, and there were, oh, there was a tent or some shit like that. And one of the kids asked, "What's the tent for?" And they're like, "Oh, mum and dad are having a party." And the kids like, "What does that mean?" It's well, where a bunch of grown ups just stand around and talk to each other. And the kids like, "That sounds like a waste of a perfectly good tent." And I, it just took me back so hard to being a kid where I just didn't understand that grown ups they don't like they don't need to play. I mean, of course, like having like a poker a poker evening or Magic the Gathering or whatever is something to do. But also adults just completely content to just stand around and talk to each other for hours. <laughs> and I was like, as a kid, just didn't understand that. I was like, why? That's boring. And there's an adult and I'm like, oh my God, just standing around and talking to other adults is great. <laughs> I mean, unless they're dead, then it's like, oh, God. Somehow we got onto the topic of comparing horror stories from work. Oh, God. One of my friends interrupted and asked, You know, we're a group of nerdy creative types and programmers who hate their jobs. Why don't we just make a video game together? And they had a point. There was Steve, the overly excitable artist and graphic designer. Fahi, the one who suggested the idea, was currently pursuing a degree in video game design. I, your theoretically humble narrator, am a writer of both words and computer code. And then there's my brother, Mike, who specializes in thinking so far outside of the box that I have to rein in his ideas back to at least a, something tangential to reality. It was honestly a good idea and something that our combined efforts were more than capable of making happen. We never spoke of it again. <laughs> but I'll come back to that in about six 70 minutes or so. Yeah, this does fit. This I don't think this is a 70 minute script, but it does feel weighty. Fortunately, I managed to find a new job, and it's still so new and remarkable to me that I can work doing something that I love here on YouTube. Oh, Kevin, I'm glad. That's nice to hear. YouTube is a pretty magical place with a seemingly infinite amount of content. There are 500 hours of video uploaded to YouTube every minute, half of which is posted by Simon. With that massive amount of videos, it's literally impossible for a company to watch them all and approve them for upload. In fact, if YouTube had hired 10,000 employees to do nothing but watch videos for approval, after a single hour, that legion of workers would already be 20,000 hours behind schedule. That is insane. To keep up with this massive load of videos, it would take the entire population of Monaco working 18 hour days, year round, to diligently monitor the content. I mean, Monaco is a really small place, though. Don't like four people. Uh, nah, it's like. It's a town or like a city. It's got to be less than a million people there, right? That's unrealistic. So YouTube found a much more elegant solution. Everyone can upload whatever they want, and it's up to us to sort it out. Technically, it's more complicated than that, and there's an automated monitoring algorithm. Oh my god, deep sigh at the monitoring algorithm as a creator. But that's pretty much the guiding principle, and it's how a channel like Unfavorable Semicircle was allowed to come into being. Okay, so Unfavorable Semicircle? After about a page, we've discovered is a YouTube channel of some variety. The YouTube monitoring thing and filtering thing drives me absolutely batty sometimes. Like, I'll upload a video that'll be called, like, The Holocaust, In-Depth, Inside Look, and YouTube will be like, BING! <laughs> green for monetization and then i'll upload something like a history of a roman legion and there won't be any violence it'll just be talking about like i don't know some really boring legion stuff 
And YouTube will be like, oh, oh, sounds like there could potentially be violence there. And it's like, bro, you just greenlit a video about the Holocaust. What are you up to? I don't mind the fact that some stuff gets demonetized. That's fine. Look, I run a cat channel called The Casual Criminalist, which lives in a constant state of uh, demonetization. That's not true. Sometimes, yeah, and that's a perfect example. It'll be like, Ed Gein, Butcher of Plainfield. Yeah, that sounds good. Even though you're literally talking about removing the intimate parts of people's bodies. And then another video will be like, the completely non-violent heist. And YouTube will be like, are you joking? We can't have that sort of nonsense on our platform. Demonetized. It's the mixed messages, YouTube. That's the really confusing part. I'm sorry, enough rants. This is seriously like not interesting to people who aren't interested in YouTube. The first YouTube channel. On March the 30th, 2015, the YouTube channel named Unfavorable Semicircle was created. Logically, this implies the existence of a favorable semicircle, but I have no idea what either of these phrases mean. On April the 5th, the channel began uploading videos, lots of videos. There was, on average, a new video every 10 minutes. Holy sh! which was truly a massive volume. Not even I do that. A channel with that sort of output certainly has the chance to be extremely engaging, but the videos were pretty formulaic and derivative. Nearly every video was just four or five seconds long, featured either a noise or a man's voice saying a single number or letter and had a video that was just a solid color with a single black pixel in a seemingly random position all right <laughs> well i guess you can't upload brilliant quality if you're uploading a video every 10 minutes the video titles were largely uninspired as well the original videos were all named using the astrological symbol for sagittarius followed by a six digit number i'm a sagittarius myself and i find it quite fitting that i would be represented by the center archer because i like to shoot things and i'm oh my gosh dude i can feel you rolling your eyes simon yes 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 so don't worry i don't actually believe in astrology <laughs> good Please don't. It's obviously nonsense. For the remainder of this episode, if I mention the name of a video, just assume that the Sagittarius symbol preceded whatever name I gave. I'm not going to make Simon keep repeating a five-syllable word a thousand times, but I promise you it's at the beginning of each video title. Noted. Sagittarius. Wow, it is five symbols. That is a long ass word. Occasionally, videos would break this normal format, and instead of being only a few seconds long, they would reach them as much as 11 hours in length. Some videos, longer videos, would contain an extremely long string of a man's voice repeating Sorry. a series of zeros and ones. Immediately I'm thinking, is someone like using YouTube as a number station? That's not a bad idea. You know the number stations. Did we do a decoding the unknown about these? I've at least made a video about these before, where it's like uh, old like spies, like spy agencies or whatever, would broadcast on the radio, on like secret radio stations, which I mean anyone can tune into, like four, nine, Charlie, 12, Bravo, September. And then it would be a boop and stuff like that. And I'm like, doing that on YouTube? So spies know which channel to watch and then they watch the video and they use that as their numbers thing? That's immediately what I'm thinking for this so far. No matter what the videos contain, there didn't seem to be any obvious meaning to them. Nearly a year went by with that channel being relatively unknown, and there's no evidence that whoever was responsible for Unfavorable Semicircle ever attempted to publicize it or wanted anyone to find out. Yeah, this sounds like... And then you could also search it. So if you were a spy, you could go to like an internet cafe or whatever, search Unfavorable Semicircle. No one else is going to be searching for that. Find the channel, which is public, watch the latest video, and then know how to decode your secret messages or whatever, or have a number stations worked? Maybe I didn't make a video about it, or either I forgot. In February 2016, Unfavorable Semicircle started to gain attention. Whatever it was they were trying to do, they knew their time was running out, and YouTube was going to bring down the hammer on them. The channel had already uploaded roughly 72,000 videos in seven months. Good lord. But on February 5th, it was, there, it was time to up their game and show they were serious. The previous upload rate of one video every 10 minutes suddenly shot up to three videos every minute. The videos previously titled almost exclusively with numbers all now contained the word brill between the Sagittarius symbol and the number. The channel received more and more coverage until finally on February the 25th, 2016, Unfavorable Semicircle was suspended from YouTube for multiple or severe violations of YouTube's policy against spam, gaming, misleading content, or other terms of service violations. Other terms of service violations is terrifying. Because I'm like, you know, this is what I do for a living. And it's like, any point. YouTube can just be like, Simon, we've uh, decided to terminate your channels because they violate other something in our terms of service. And they can do whatever they want. I'm not one of these people who believe that I have some freedom of speech right. I think people fundamentally misunderstand freedom of speech and that it obviously doesn't apply to private companies. Like, YouTube can choose to not publish whatever the f they want. They're a company. And if they decided not to publish any of my stuff, if they were like, Simon, uh, we believe in ghosts and we're very unhappy about decoding the unknown, 
and they decided to shut it down, I'd be like, I think that's stupid. But it's also their f***ing company. They can do whatever they want. Freedom of speech does not apply to a private enterprise. <laughs> and it's also a very only American thing. And, and YouTube's an American company, sure. But it's it's for governments, no? But yeah, it's scary to know that they could take it all away. Given that they were now a well over 100,000 videos, it was probably the spam thing. Much of the earlier speculation surrounding Unfavorable Semicircle was that it was just a test akin to WebDriver Torso. That speculation went right out of the window as soon as the channel was taken down. After all, YouTube wasn't going to suspend their own quality control channel just because people noticed it was there. Oh yeah, this could be like another test thing. Ah, uh, like the, the WebDriver Torso was some video channel we mentioned previously, which YouTube was using to test stuff. But this sounds, a, I don't know, this isn't like that. So, if all the early speculation was wrong, just what the hell was this channel? Real life sharing, rethought for the web. If the slogan sounds familiar to you, it totally doesn't, then congratulations. No congratulations, for fact, boy. You are one of 17 people who enjoyed using Google+. Yeah, no one enjoyed using Google+. Google+, Plus was something we were forced to use. Like, was it just YouTube? When was Google Plus? Was this before I was a YouTuber and I was just using Google Plus? Or was this when I was a YouTuber and they forced me to have Google Plus? Something happens, and at some point I had Google Plus, and I was like, what, what? I had to convert something to Google Plus. Why? Yeah, I don't know, man. Uh, and one of the others was none other than Unfavorable Semicircle. On March the 14th, just a few weeks after YouTube had suspended the original channel, the Google Plus account made its first post. The post was a bunch of garbled text that, when decoded, revealed a link to a Twitter page and a new YouTube channel, both just named Unfavorable Semi. Shortly after the Google Plus post was found, it was deleted, but clearly someone wanted it to be found and was monitoring the situation. At the time the new YouTube channel was discovered, there were four videos posted. One was titled Brill49999, which was posted the same day as the other channel was taken down, and another was named N Asterix Brill, was nearly seven hours long and appeared to be every video from the original channel, whose name began with Brill, just all strung together into one video. The Twitter account at the time of discovery had about 7,200 videos pushed to it, all in the same style as the original YouTube channel. Both the YouTube and Twitter accounts continued to post massive amounts of videos, though there were occasional pauses. After one multiple week pause, a new channel, Stability Newing, was launched, though fans of this mystery wouldn't have confirmation it was real for nearly a year. This is, I still think maybe it's the uploading so many videos, I felt take, took the winds out of my spy theory a little bit because there's not, they're not going to need that many videos. There's going to be like less and right. But maybe this is some sort of game or part of some like, I don't know, I always think of like this could be some like spy recruiting thing or recruiting thing for some like super competitive company where they're like, if you could figure out this puzzle, or you figured out this was a puzzle and solved it, then you get invited to an interview with like the NSA or something. The Strange Reset Things had continued on as normal for a while on Twitter and YouTube, but then there was a longer than normal pause. After over two months with no new posts, on September the 15th, 2017, a new video titled Strange Reset YD appeared. Within 30 minutes of the video being discovered, it was removed from the channel. A few more minutes and both YouTube channels and the Twitter page would all be manually shut down by the owners. All that remained was the Google Plus account, and that of course is now gone as well since Google finally abandoned that project. Maybe this was all a commentary on the social networking site, and the unfavorable semicircle was just your circle of friends, both unfavorable and semi, because you couldn't actually get anyone to join your circle online because who wanted to use Google Plus? A final post on the Google Plus account appeared on March the 28th and was simply titled Real. Below the subject line was a list of accounts that were clearly being identified as the real accounts used by the creators of the project. There were many fakes and hoaxes, as to be expected, but it was nice to have the creators of such cryptic projects set the record straight on the matter. You know, since they couldn't be bothered to give a single hint as to what any of this nonsense was supposed to mean. This is so much effort. If it means nothing, and it leads to nothing, it's a ton of effort that someone keeps going to for a long time for no reason. So there's got to be something to it. Or it's kind of... This is not... It's not even an interesting prank if there's nothing to it. So... There has to be, right? I hope this isn't going to be one of those things that's like, we get to the end and then nobody ever knew. <laughs> it's like... 20 pages long, so I'm hoping we get some sort of resolution. This post mentioned all the accounts we've mentioned so far, specifically noting that the Twitter account was only real until the date of the strange reset. 30 days after a Twitter account has been deactivated, anyone else can come and take that name. Naturally, someone did and was masquerading as the real semicircle, so they wanted to be sure to set the record straight that this was total bullshit. I can't tell you how many total videos have been created by Unfavorable Semicircle over the years, but it looks to be over 200,000. 
Jesus Christ. And I thought, I've made thousands of videos. I guess like two, three thousand now. And I thought that was a lot. 200,000. I mean, although they're all 11 seconds long. Or well, somewhere 11 hours long. Because of both the YouTube termination of the original page and the very ex unexpected strange reset, I can tell you that, sadly, a lot of these videos are lost to the ages. While everything that happened after the original channel was suspended was very quickly backed up by people out of fear of it being deleted again, the archive of the original channel is woefully incomplete. There are a little over 77,000 videos from the original channel archived, which means there's still tens of thousands of videos potentially lost. Why are they all still using the Brill naming convention? Then the re-upload of those onto the second channel would have filled in the gaps. Without the files, though, we can't be positive one way or the other. The real Google Plus post was the last communication ever received from Unfavorable Semicircle. All of the accounts associated with it are long deleted, with the exception of a backup Twitter account at Unfavorable Sem, which has never posted anything. This is very weird. Like I don't, I don't, I don't really have a lot of theories right now, other than some weird game that someone's trying to play like to recruit people to the nsa or some shit. but i'm also like that's just not really that likely i feel like the nsa just recruits people in the normal way that spies get recruited taps on shoulders <laughs> i don't know <laughs> these days probably just like websites just apply <laughs> seasons and series with hundreds of thousands of videos, there needed to be some way to organize them for clearer communication amongst the solvers. Originally, the community broke the videos into what they considered seasons. They noticed that videos posted on the same date or date range would have similarities in the audio or the colors used. The seasons were given names, such as Logic, because the videos were a seemingly endless string of the male voice speaking ones and zeros, or Fumble, because it sounded like someone fumbling with the microphone. These names were cute, but they could potentially obscure whatever the intended meaning of the videos were. Fortunately, Unfavorable Semicircle took care of that for us. While the original videos were all just strings of numbers, eventually they contained words as well. I already mentioned Brill on the original YouTube channel, but there were many more series on the other channels and on Twitter. All had simple one-word names such as Brine, Duel, and Brother. Note that not all of the named videos were part of a series. There were a large number of standalone videos as well. I mentioned earlier that every video began with the Sagittarius symbol, and for the most part that was true. However, the Stability Newing channel had two series, Brother and Belt. Instead of the zodiac sign, the videos on this channel began with a plus sign inside of a circle, which is the symbol for the XOR logic gate that you may remember from Cicada 3301. I don't remember. I don't remember. And I I've recorded a lot of videos since then. If your eyes haven't glazed over yet from being overloaded with information, I, I, I'm paying attention, Kevin. You may have noticed that I mentioned the word brother twice. Yes, there are two different series, both named brother, but we'll get back to that when we get to the more mystical portion of this episode. Mystical, huh? Lock and D-Lock. On the original channel, there were two videos of particular interest to people trying to decipher any sort of meaning to this channel. Lock was posted on July the 18th, 2015, and D-Lock was posted on December the 29th, 2015. Given the fact that they had coherent names rather than just numbers, and considering what the names were, it was thought that these two videos were the keys to uncovering what secrets unfavorable semicircle might hold. There is definitely one very important thing we can tell from these names, as our big brain listeners are probably yelling at the devices right now. Now, D-lock is not a word, the word is unlock. This almost certainly means that either the creator of these videos does not speak English as their first language, or that D-lock is not going to be used to unlock the meaning of everything, and everyone is completely misinterpreting the name. My money is on both. I think the latter's, I mean, I don't, I don't think it indicates anything about English. I think it's just uh, a strange word that someone made up. We'll start with the video for D-lock because it's the one we know most about. The audio sounds like some weird carousel with sound effects being played over it. The male voice from the other videos is once again present and recites a series of letters over this track as well. The video looks like this. Over the course of a nearly three minute video, the white lines stay completely stationary, but the colors of the other pixels rapidly change. Okay, so there's some colors, I thought it was just an error with my printing or the image, but the colors in the background change. No meaning has been derived yet from this video, shocking I know, but there are a few notable things about the audio. At first, people thought the audio was taken from Steamboat Willie, the classic Disney short, classic meaning old, not good. On June the 19th, 2020, a Discord user discovered that the music was actually a manipulated version of the song Homesick by Bailey's Lucky Seven, which was, of course, the B-side to their single Carolina in the Morning. Of course. Yeah, I've definitely heard of all of these. Another video from Semicircle titled Retio was found to contain the hit song Away Down East in Maine by Miss Patricola. 
These are hit songs. I've never heard of any of these stuff. Don't worry, Simon. There's a very good reason. You have no idea what these songs are. Okay. The songs were both hits in 1922. Holy sh**. That was back in the day, which is potentially a very significant year. As of 2015, when Semicircle was creating these videos, nothing after 1922 had entered the public domain. The channels may never have been monetized and the audio was distorted, but it would seem that the creators did not want to risk their videos being taken down because of a copyright issue. Fair enough. Or they just picked random obscure music they didn't want people to recognize, and it was purely coincidental that both songs were from the last year to be public domain. Again, maybe both. The letters spoken at the beginning of the video were another major point of contention with the music and sounds in the background. It was hard to make them out perfectly. Someone decided to visually examine the audio wave, then compare it to audio waves from videos of the voice speaking letters and numbers without background noise. If we treat the long pauses between the letters as spaces, and I can't think of any reason we wouldn't, the letters spoken spell out, I am not H. That's fantastic, and this whole video seems like a massive step forward compared to the otherwise indecipherable nature of most of the videos, but who or what is H? If the song title was a clue and the full sentence was supposed to be, I am not homesick, what does that even tell us? Why would we think that it's supposed to be, I am not homesick? Because the song was... It was a manipulated version of the song Homesick? I mean, that's a bit of a stretch, but okay. Is this an alien communication and they just want us to know that they like Earth better than their home planet? Not that one. Of course not, but if I can dispose of the aliens theory here, then I won't have to bring it up along all, all of the other actual theories. No matter how popular a theory it is, and I can assure you it's a very popular theory, Unfavorable Semicircle was not created by aliens as a means of communicating with us. Yes. That's not how it's gonna work. Aliens come down to Earth and like, how should we communicate with the human populace? Let's get some research on that internet thing. The aliens would just be like, exterminate them now. <laughs> Why would they communicate with us? It'd be like you attempt to communicate with an ant. These aliens have presumably traveled across the vastness of space in super futuristic spacecrafts. It'd be like you go into the forest having a chat with an ant. It makes no sense. If you wanted to kill the ant, you'd kill the ant. If you wanted to leave it alone, you'd leave it alone. You don't talk to it. It's an ant. If life from another planet was smart enough to conquer intergalactic travel and land on Earth undetected, then they're smart enough to communicate with humanity without resorting to whatever this is supposed to be. Oh no, Kevin, they don't need, they won't, just won't communicate with humanity. This brings us to the earlier video, Lock. Lock is 27 minutes long and the audio is just garbage noise that gets painful after a while. The video, on the other hand, is much more interesting. Sort of. The video itself just flashes a bunch of colors rapidly. At this point, I should warn any listeners that want to investigate this mystery more on their own, do not watch these videos if you're prone to seizures. Anyway, watching the video is not interesting, but creating a composite image of the video is. A composite is created by taking all of the frames and aligning them nicely into a square or rectangle. What size square or rectangle, you ask? No, yeah, whatever looks pretty, I guess. No, really, the width of the image is determined by what looks like it is making a picture and it is entirely guesswork. You might be thinking that someone could just place the frames in order and guess different size rectangles until they got something that they felt looked like an image and you would be correct. Still, when you have a 27 minute video of seemingly arbitrary colors flashing on the screen and then arrange them to make this image, it's kind of hard not to think that it's an accident or coincidence. Okay. Oh my, that is kind of cre- Wow, okay. I mean, put that image on screen right now. That is not a coincidence. There's like clearly shading there. And I mean, that is clearly an image of some kind. Who would think to take each frame and line them up like that? But it's wild. I, that is, there's no way that that's a coincidence. If you need further proof that this is not an accident, the very first video posted to the second official semicircle channel was called Relock, and the composite of that video was the same image, but cleaned up a bit and crisper to make it more defined. There's no way that this was not intentional, but also what on earth is it? Some of the more popular guesses include a watch, uh, maybe, I don't know about that, a skull, or some kind of coin, or a recreation of the MC Escher painting, Hand with a Reflecting Sphere. I gotta look that up. Meanwhile. Ah, uh, no. Oh god, I don't know, what does it look like? It looks like... Oh, it, I mean, you can see why someone thinks it's a watch. Actually, I'm coming around to think that it could be... Could be a watch, but not quite. Maybe like some strange bracelet or something? It's kind of creepy, to be honest. Another suggestion I've seen batted around, and the one that I'm embarrassed to say looks the most like to me, is a hand holding a pokeball. It's probably not that, regardless of what it's supposed to be. The discovery 
Is there a hand? I don't know if I see a hand in there, though. It's probably not that. Regardless of what it's supposed to be, the discovery of composite images for some of the videos was pretty groundbreaking. Composite images. Apologies to those listening as a podcast instead of watching on YouTube, but we can't properly cover Unfavorable Semicircle without going over a few more images. We've already looked at one composite and the clearly intentional nature of it. While a lot of these images are very abstract, they were still images that were presumably trying to communicate something. While there is a lot of composites created from these, there are three in particular that I'd like to highlight. The first one comes from the Breadth series. Breadth contains two videos, both with similar composites. While the original composites looked a bit more like a magic eye image, no matter how they were sized, the breakthrough came when the investigators tried plotting them as three-dimensional figures rather than 2D images. This 3D figure that Simon might be thinking looks like a ringed planet is in fact an atom. Yeah, I looked at this before we started today's episode. It does look like a spinning atom. These images were a significant discovery for showing the existence of 3D composites within these videos and because the resulting composites are really pretty. The next image to take a look is a composite of Node. Node was a standalone video rather than part of a series, and the resulting composite has been compared to paintings by Russian abstract artist Wassily Kandinsky. Whoa, okay, that's pretty wild. Um, it just looks like a crazy painting, but there's clearly patterns in there. This is not some just random static noise. There's clearly patterns. Other than being kind of cool looking, despite my hatred of abstract art, there are a few key features here to point out. First, the striped flag in the top left corner. Similar flags are found in other composites, and they seem to serve as a method of verifying that the composite was built correctly. If you recall, the width of the image is determined simply by guessing, so this is an easy way to tell if they were assembled correctly. You won't be able to see it without massively blowing up the image, but above the flag on the top row is a series of black and white pixels. Let's get Okay, yeah, I just about see it in there. They also appeared in many composites, and it appears to be binary code. While many of the messages have just translated to gibberish thus far, the message in Node reads HE backslash PSONG. By changing a single bit in the third character, which may have been just an encoding error, error it becomes help song. So, okay, what is the help song? While Node also contains something known as the melody, the roughly two and a half hour long video is mostly silence. There are five sections with sound totaling less than a minute. The majority of the noises have been identified as being sampled from the music video for Apex Twins' song The Window Licker. <laughs> this is such a strange music selection. Specifically, the sounds made by Screeching Limousine. Apex Twins were not active in 1922, but using a sound effect from their video is probably okay, though using their music would not be. The melody occurs just three minutes after the end of the video, and it's only 11 seconds long. It has been transcribed to sheet music, but thus far, no one has been able to identify the melody itself. The most notable thing that has been discovered regarding the melody is that it is written in 432 hertz tuning compared to the standard 440 hertz. But we'll come back to that when we deal with the mystical bull later. The final composite that we need to address is from another standalone video titled Harvest. You probably think this doesn't necessarily look like much, and you'd be correct. The notable aspect of this is that this image is broken up into three distinct panels. There is again the striped flag in the first panel to ensure that it was decoded properly. The second panel is what we really need to examine. However, it looks mostly black with some bits of red and white here and there. Yes, okay. This is a very strange one I'm looking at. The one on the top left kind of looks like a turtle in a shell. Maybe. But a weird turtle. Or like a mushroom or something. I don't know. What could this possibly be for? This is. Someone's going to enormous effort to make these. It's very elaborate. But there's also some sort of design near the bottom of the panel. It's hard to tell what it is when it's zoomed out, but it's hard to tell what it is when it's zoomed in too. If you're able to get the image the perfect size and squint just right, you can see that these are actually words. Oh, really? I mean, yeah, I guess. God, I gotta get in super close. I mean, I can't see it now, but I guess you could. The words in the image read, Art is a diverse range of human activities in creating visual, auditory, or performing artifacts. Artworks expressing the authors. Dude, what does that even mean? While it has since been reworded, at the time Harvest was posted, this was the beginning of the Wikipedia entry for art. Wait, really? Art is a diverse range of human activities in creating visual, auditory, or performing artifacts. Artworks expressing the authors. Oh, okay, expressing the authors. And then obviously the sentence continues on, but we're just missing that. So, is that it then? Is it really that simple and this is all just an art project? That's certainly possible, but this could also have just served as proof of concept that they could encode words hidden within the images. This is crazy. So you've got an image 
You've got words hidden within an image, hidden within a video. It's cool, I like it. That's pretty cool. It could also be a decoy to make the less educated investigators believe that they'd solved the puzzle, leaving the true secrets to be revealed only to the most relentless of pursuers. As to be expected when examining such a voluminous mystery, there's only one way we can cover every detail. I've made sure to hit the most important information so that you can understand how elaborate both the puzzle and the efforts to decode it have been. What should also be expected, of course, is that when a mystery has such an immense mountain of content with very little known about it, there's also going to be a mountain of theories. Many of the theories we can quickly dismiss, but some of them require a deeper dive. I hope you're hyped, Simon, because it's time for us to dive head first into some astrology oh, astrology is the worst but also i'm sure like people believe in it and they can make it part of their weird mysterious thing doesn't mean any of it's true but this could be fun all right astrology here we go astrology is as real as ghosts the loch ness monster oh my god i just literally before recording this one recorded a decoding the unknown about the loch ness monster and we came to the conclusion that no it is not real they dna tested the water there's no lizards in there there's no giant beasts it's kind of, in my opinion, totally disproven. And aliens inhabiting planet Earth. I know our audience has two sets of listeners who are going to both agree with that statement for opposite reasons, but so be it. Still, whether astrology is real or not doesn't matter. Unfavorable semicircle does not purport to be some divine manuscript passed down from the heavens. It is a man-made or possibly computer script generated series of cryptic videos. Whether the person or persons responsible for semicircle chose to incorporate aspects of astrology in their work is all that we care about. At the very least, they obviously included the symbol for Sagittarius, but is this because they are a firm believer in reading stars? Probably not, but they may have included some astrology anyway because they think that it's neat or whatever. Some researchers made connections between some of the videos and various astrological signs. We already covered Sagittarius. Next came the series Brill, which is a type of fish. This could be representative of Pisces. While most sets... Wait, Brill is a type of fish? Oh, okay, and Pisces is also a fish. Oh my god, I know nothing about astrology. Doesn't... People are like, oh, Simon, well, maybe if you learned a little bit about astrology, you'd find out it's real. I'm obviously not. It's not like I'll learn more about witchcraft and discover it's real. If I learn more about Harry Potter, I'm not going to discover it's real. That's not how that works. While most sets have unique names, you may recall that there were two brothers, which would of course be Gemini. Of course, the Gemini brothers, famous. Finally, that leaves us with the video Harvest, with Virgo being heavily associated with Harvest Goddess mythology. Alright, Kevin, I'll take your word for it. I have no idea. This set of four zodiac signs gives us two pairs of opposing signs, one sign from each of the four seasons, one sign from each of the four elements, and it is all four mutable signs. Oh my god, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Stop rolling your eyes, Simon. All we had to do to arrive at this destination was cherry pick the data points that we found useful while ignoring the other 150,000 videos uploaded by Semicircle. <laughs> That, ladies and gentlemen, is called science. No, that, ladies and gentlemen, is called fucking astrology. Maybe that ended a bit sarcastically, but these theories aren't necessarily without merit. While none of this provides any information about who made these videos or why, understanding the meaning or inspiration behind them could very well be the first step to finding those answers. While we're on the topic of astrology and other such hocus pocus, let's quickly revisit the 432 hertz tuning. Oh, that was the songs, right? So they were tuned slightly differently to regular music? Okay. The informal standard for music since 1926 has been to tune note A above middle C to 440 hertz. However, there are those out there that refer to 432 hertz as the god note. It is said to bring about a feeling of calm, coupled with great outlook on life. Scientific research has shown that no, it's just the placebo effect and nothing different is happening to your brain. That's oh, very surprising, isn't it? Uh, to have that found out. I tried listening to the entirety of Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon at 432 hertz, and it's pretty much the same. It sounded slightly off, probably on account of everything being 32 cents flat, but it definitely didn't make me feel any better about life or the universe. Still, if the creator composed this piece in 432 hertz tuning, they may have been a believer in the fake science of the god note, and so it gives us a solid reason to believe that they are a believer in astrology as well. Yeah, it's true. It's like people who believe in one 
nonsense thing often believe in other nonsense things because that rational part of their brain doesn't work properly. Astrology did give us one very important thing, however, the only remotely feasible explanation given for the name Unfavorable Semicircle. Seriously, I've looked everywhere and I can't find a single suggestion for the meaning behind the name that isn't clearly a joke. The irony of this is that if the name actually does come from astrology, then the name itself is intended to be a joke. There are no semicircles in astrology, but there is a semi-square. I feel like a semi-square would just be known as a rectangle, which is considered an unfavorable aspect. A semi-square is a 45-degree angle between two planets. Oh my god, who cares? It's similar to the square in that it shows tension, but also challenges that can help us learn and grow. Yeah, I just realized I have no idea. Do they look at the angles between planets? Do they actually do that? I kind of thought it was all... I mean, I know, obviously that doesn't make any of it any more real in any way whatsoever, but I just kind of thought it was made up, like, you know, like tarot cards being like, oh, you've got death. That means you're gonna die. You know, that kind of bullshit. But they're actually looking at planets and shit. Wow. I mean, I'm not impressed because it would be me like looking at really complicated maths formulas and being like, hmm, there's a letter A there, there's a letter U there, A U. Could mean something, could mean something. They're just like parts of a giant formula. It doesn't make you smart. It's similar to the square in that it shows tension, but also challenges to help to learn and to grow. The difference with the semi square is that any conflicts felt are more subtle than the square, so it's easy to ignore them rather than to actually grow or solve problems. The name unfavorable semicircle could possibly be a play on the idea of the unfavorable semi-square and an allusion to the fact that many things in this puzzle are easy to ignore, leaving them missed uh, opportunities for growth or discovery. It's not only a reasonably plausible explanation, it's honestly the only explanation that i found so far. Whoever made this clearly knows lots about astrology, because I've learned more about astrology in the last five minutes than I've learned throughout my whole life. I think I told that story before where I was really excited because I went to like the local news agents and they had, as a kid, and then like a big magazine selection, I saw one, it was like, astronomy and i'm like sweet i'm gonna get this astronomy magazine i love science and the stars and all i'm gonna learn about this and i get home and i open it up and it's all talking about all sorts of weird shit about like how you can predict the future and i'm like why is this nonsense and then i realized that that was when i discovered astrology it was very disappointing <laughs> Theories galore. So, let's start by going through all the extremely unlikely theories that I'm contractually obliged to cover, just so the comments aren't filled with people asking me why I left out their pet theory. But if I somehow do leave out your pet theory, be sure to get in the comments and let me know about it, and then we'll absolutely shut down your nonsense. Alien communication. It wasn't aliens 20 minutes ago, so I don't know why you lunatics have changed since then. Viral advertising campaign. Considering how long the project has gone on with no apparent purpose, this is extremely unlikely. Yeah, it's like, yo, what did you advertise? Nothing. It's not, no. Obviously not. Trolling. Pretty much the same rationale as the last theory. Not that trolling has an apparent purpose other than to annoy and enrage, but this is far too sophisticated and has gone on for far too long to have been done for the lulls, especially since it would have required more than one computer dedicated full time to uploading videos. Yeah, Kevin, but I don't feel like this one can be entirely dismissed as quite as brutally as the others. Because, yo, you might just have found someone who's just really crazy and has loads of money. And it's just like, yeah, what shall I do? Go on the ultimate trolling campaign for no reason whatsoever and use multiple computers and all my free time and just to mess with people. I think that could be a possibility. I mean, I don't think it's likely. Don't get me wrong. I don't think it's likely, but it's not unbelievably impossible. I mean, I hope not. I, I hope it's not that, because otherwise this is a very boring video. You just get to the end and you're like... So that is a guy just just trolling. Great. <laughs> So boring. Recruitment puzzle or test? Okay, that was my theory from earlier. The sheer complexity of the mystery is reminiscent of Cicada 3301, but normally a recruitment puzzle has some sort of announcement surrounding it. The complete lack of direction or instruction makes it unlikely that this being used as a recruitment tool, why would anyone waste their time on something so complex and potentially meaningless if they had no reason to believe that they were being recruited for something? Alternate reality game, ARG. We've seen some convoluted ARGs, but like a recruitment puzzle, they generally have some sort of direction or narrative. A game that ran as long as this did without ever giving a single explicit hint, despite the lack of progress being made, would be extremely poorly thought out. Unfavorable semicircle may not like make a lot of sense, but someone can't upload three videos per minute that assemble into composite images that we saw and not be accused of having thought things out. Before the more substantial theories, there's also one so-called theory 
that I do need to address. Whenever there is a mystery, especially an internet mystery, one of the theories is always work of a disturbed mind. Okay, so that's basically what I came up with earlier, just like some dude who's just crazy. This seems to be a catch-all phrase that means I don't understand or approve of what you're doing. Galileo's assertion that the Earth revolved around the Sun, Picasso's abstract paintings, and John Nash's contributions to game theory and mathematics were all considered works of a disturbed mind. If you're trying to remember who John Nash is, oh no, I, I don't need to know. We know John Nash is. If you've seen the movie A Beautiful Minds, that's such a brilliant movie. And, and game theory and all of this stuff is so interesting. It's the guy that a movie A Beautiful Mind is based on. There you go. Any mental illness, real or perceived, that these people suffered with should not take away from the works they created. It does a disservice to both yourself and the creator to write something off as being the work of a disturbed individual and assuming it has no merit. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. All right, Kevin, fine. <laughs> but I don't mean it's like the person's disturbed. I just mean it's like they're an extremely like uh, they've, they're a troll with loads of time on their hands and there's a poor concept of trolling number station one of the earliest theories of any merit was that this was some sort of online number stations there we go that's what i thought right at the beginning but then like the images within the videos and all of this stuff made me think no I don't think that's it. Number stations were cryptic, shortwave radio stations that would broadcast repeating series of numbers. They would sometimes employ a handshake, a signal designated to authenticate a broadcast before an important sequence of numbers. These stations were particularly popular during the Cold War, though some are still in operation today. Some of the semicircle videos include a handshake followed by a list of numbers, so the parallel was quite apparent. There are some definite benefits to a number station hosted on YouTube rather than via shortwave radio. There's no infrastructure cost, as all the hosting and broadcasting is done by YouTube. A huge benefit is that there's no geographic restriction. Traditional number stations require agents to be within a range of transmission, but by doing it online, they can be anywhere in the world. It also makes the broadcast harder to track since there's no physical transmission site. Much like with a traditional number station, a user who stumbled upon this channel would have no way to decode it without the key, leaving it as an internet curiosity. Yeah, agreed. This this was exactly my thought process super early in today's video when all we had was the videos and we didn't have any of the deeper stuff and the text within the images within the videos it kind of, that kind of just made it too complicated for that once the station went viral and was subsequently shut down there were the google plus posts list directing to new locations this indicated that the creator wanted people to find it but the posts were always deleted shortly after their creation a possible explanation for this would be that they wanted to ensure that their agents had time to find the new stations but they wanted it to remain publicly available for as brief a period of time as possible to avoid another potential shutdown notably while the twitter account was immediately given by google plus and subsequently led to the second YouTube channel, the third and fourth YouTube channels were not confirmed to be real until after the strange reset when everything had shut down. Any agents utilizing the number stations would have been likely to have been informed of the addition of YouTube, additional YouTube channels by a decoded message long before this happened. But if this was a secret number stations, then why would you confirm either of these channels have been a part of it, and why specify that the Twitter account was no longer under their control? Yeah, that makes no sense. Because you would want to pass on the new location of the new number station YouTube channel to your spies you wouldn't need to announce it publicly or just put it in one of the previous messages before the channel got shut down but what if the channel got shut down and then the only thing left was the google plus and then they needed to do it publicly now they must have like some secret way of communicating it like they'd use code words or something they'd have a backup obviously still this would also give a good explanation for why most of the uploads were clearly done by a computer script as there's literally no way that this could have all been done manually without an army of people involved yet there was still evidence of human interaction most notably the google plus post and the creation of new outlets for the videos after the initial channel was terminated but also the very occasional renaming of the existing videos yeah you can automatically upload videos to youtube of course um i actually did this for a long time not a long time but you could uh if you there was a pro i think it was like if this then that or uh maybe zapier it's like one of these automation tools and i had it set up that whenever a video was added to a dropbox folder it would automatically upload it to the youtube channel so kevin earlier saying you needed multiple computers you didn't really because um zapier would run all this for you behind the scenes so you just added the dropbox folder. you could add 10 videos and they'd all upload to youtube within seconds it was crazy because i guess it's just going direct from dropbox's servers to youtube somehow like via zapier with mad internet connections and this was so convenient but then all my channels just started doing like every channel i did this with just started the views just started dying and i was like oh my god is this the end what's going on why are all my videos getting no views like or so few views like getting no exposure in the algorithm right out of the gate and uh the only thing i changed was that i started doing this automatic uploading from dropbox to youtube 
And then I stopped doing that and everything was fine again. And I'm like, why? <laughs> it was so strange. And I was just really glad that it started working again and people started watching the videos again. But yeah, that Dropbox automatically threw Zapier to YouTube, that was, it was super convenient. I just wish I could do it now, but I'm too afraid to do it because the last time I did it, it just destroyed my views for seemingly no reason at all. Fascinating tangent, Simon. It's a plausible theory overall, but it has some holes. A common theme among all of these theories is that none of them fit everything perfectly. And as such, a lot of information will just be classified as red herrings. The composite images, the melody, the Wikipedia entry for art. In this theory, all of these are red herrings to distract people from the true meaning of semicircle and distract distract internet sleuths from potentially uncovering the secret. Satisfying? Not really, but it's well within the realm of possibility. Penetration test. I will spare you the technical details of what a penetration test is. The short version is that it is a test or a series of tests to find exploits or vulnerabilities in a computer system that would allow a bad actor to deploy a payload of malicious code to the system or use the system to deploy that malware to other users. If that's still a little complex, the even shorter version is, let's f with YouTube and see if we can break it. <laughs> yeah. This is like, I don't know, one of those... It, Penna, this is people just messing around with stuff like hackers or whatever. I would say like one of the things I always do when I'm bored on a plane and you know there's the in-flight entertainment, I'm like, let's see if I can break this. Like, let's see if I can find a menu that goes nowhere or a link that takes me to something that I shouldn't see or a file folder, you know, and you're just playing around with it and you're like, okay, what if I put it in this language and then go here and do that? Because you're sitting in on a plane for hours with nothing to do and there's just boring in-flight entertainment. I'm always just like, can I break this? Can I do this? Or like, you know, where they've got those touch screens in a museum and you're like, I wonder if I can get this back to Windows. <laughs> I don't know. It's just something I do because I'm a dick. There are a few different possible end goals here, but they're all connected in that the purpose of the videos was malicious hacking. Before some software engineers roast me in the comments, yes, I realize that pen tests are traditionally considered ethical hacking, but this obviously wasn't authorized by YouTube or the original channel never would have been shut down. Anyway, the first possible goal was that they were trying to find a way to make the videos contain a nefarious payload. If such an exploit could be found, this would be a huge deal. This is not entirely unsubstantiated either. Okay, that's crazy. I don't know anything about computer hacking, but I kind of understand how if you're uploading a video to YouTube, that you're taking data from your computer and you're putting it onto YouTube's computer, and if somehow you could make that data, even though it's supposed to be a video file, be something that can damage YouTube or get you access to things you don't, you're not supposed to have access to. I never thought about that, but that, that is, all of this stuff is so fast. I find this very fascinating. It's like I don't know anything about it, but it is very interesting. Android users reported difficulties and strange behavior with the channel, such as videos causing their phones to crash or videos continuing beyond the stated runtime. While these events definitely happen, there's no way to know whether Semicircle was explicitly focusing on this or whether it was just an accident. Oh, and then also, of course, you've got the possibility of you're uploading data to YouTube that people are then downloading to their apps or whatever as videos, and if you could make that video somehow screw with the... Okay, I see. This is crazy. Hackers are clever. The semicircle videos were full of small encoding errors, and Android is notorious for problems in how the system passes video. It keeps getting fixed, but then a new variant will emerge, and it's the same problem all over again. It's the COVID of Android exploits. Still, there's no way to know if this exploit showing up was intentional or accidental. The other slightly less malicious goals of a penetration test would be to reverse engineer YouTube and Twitter's internal systems. One of the biggest clues that this could be a possibility is that the videos contain compression artifacts, nothing noticeable to distortions when encoded by YouTube's proprietary video codec, and someone could be reading those artifacts to reverse engineer the codec. They could then use similar methods of analysis to reverse engineer other internal processes. Yeah, it's crazy. Like the amount of, like YouTube's compression algorithm or whatever it does, when you upload a video, like I'll upload a video maybe like three gigabytes big or whatever, and then you want to download it for you from YouTube, they're always like, yeah, it's 300 megabytes. And it still looks good. I mean, not great, but still good. It's quite crazy. That's crazy! Once again, we find ourselves meeting a plausible theory that has to hand wave a bunch of details as being red herrings. Yeah, like the images hidden within the videos, and then the text hidden within those images hidden within the videos. You're just handing off a lot of complicated stuff that people... I mean, unless they did it to throw people off on purpose, but then what's the point? Why do you need to throw people off? Havana Syndrome. Wait, isn't that that thing where the embassies get blasted with, like, energy? 
or apparently, and stuff like that. In August of 2017, reports began surfacing that American and Canadian diplomatic personnel in Cuba were experiencing strange and unexplained health problems, the problems having begun in late 2016. The original events all started with personnel hearing strange grating noises, some records of which were later identified as the sounds of crickets. The noises lasted anywhere from 20 seconds to 30 minutes, and happened when the diplomats were either in their homes or hotel rooms. Other people nearby were not affected, and it seems that most or all of the affected people were wearing earpieces, a combination of diplomats, CIA, and Secret Service. The symptoms that followed included pain in one or both ears, feeling pressure or vibrations in the head, visual problems, nausea, cognitive difficulties, and dizziness. Some people even suffered brain damage or other permanent impairments. These attacks began well after Unfavorable Semicircle had gone viral, and the strange reset occurred very shortly after reports of Havana Syndrome were known. Oh my god, how are these two things possibly connected? At which point, the whole project had already gone silent for a month anyway. The theory is definitely a bit out there, but if you needed a testing ground for the effects of audio and visual stimulus on unsuspecting people, what better way to do it than using a series of viral videos on a website with 122 million daily users? It didn't take long for people watching and trying to decipher these videos to report some issues. Nothing as intense as a Fana syndrome, but definitely pain dizziness and generally feeling off one video that affected me pretty intensely is brother 31 if anyone at home wants to test it out it happened for me at around the three minutes 30 mark and several seconds later for the person who recommended that particular video to me he described it as a slightly painful uncomfortable feeling in his left ear for reasons unknown to myself i just watched the video again when i began writing this section even though i already tested this days ago and 30 minutes after listening to it my ear is still in pretty intense pain Really? Okay. After recording this, f it, I'm gonna go do this right now. I'm so skeptical. This isn't gonna happen to me. A little longer than a few minutes later. I'm back. Uh, my ear is totally fine. <laughs> Maybe that will change. I'll let you know. Ah, oh, no, just joking, not really. I recognize this sounds like a total tinfoil hat theory, but the timeline can't be ignored. The creation and termination of Semicircle fit a little too perfectly. They uploaded thousands of videos with very similar but slightly different noises, threw in enough clues to keep people focused on any possibility except this, and monitored all the investigations for people reporting any ill effects and what videos caused them. Unlike with the penetration test theory, it also gives good reason why they wanted to alert people where to go to continue watching the videos after YouTube took down the original channel. I don't want to consider this theory as the most likely, but it's also not something I'm willing to completely dismiss offhand either. I'd say it's, uh, it, I don't think it's likely. I can't dismiss it offhand entirely, but I just don't think it's likely. The Eye of the Beholder I have a suspicion that Simon has already proclaimed this as his frontrunner, but possibly the cleanest theory for this whole mess is that it's simply an art project. Yeah, I mean, that's also like the most boring theory. I like the one about it being a penetration test. I think that's... I don't know. It's probably not very likely, is it? <laughs> I like that one, though. The beauty of calling this art is that in a very vague and abstract way, it explains everything. Any question one could possibly ask regarding the contents of these videos can be brushed aside with a, it's an artistic vision, you meandering peasants. The composite images, the strict adherence to only using public domain music, the text from the Wikipedia entry for art, it all points to one solution. The biggest criticism one could levy is that it seems pointless to create hundreds of thousands of individual pieces knowing that no one could possibly view and appreciate all of them. But the obvious answer is that the work as a whole is the singular art piece is and each individual video is but a brush stroke there's just one more thing while anything regarding the contents or the meaning can be explained by just calling it art there's still the whole process of creating it someone would need both an artistic vision and an extraordinary knowledge of programming steganography video and sound editing and a breadth of other extremely complex technical processes i'm not saying that it's impossible history is littered with artists who are also scientists but i'm saying that i have consumed far more of this art than i would have preferred and whoever created this is not da vinci while the most plausible solution the biggest thing keeping it from being widely accepted is that it's too damn boring of an answer yes people have dedicated thousands of hours trying to decode this and do you expect them to believe that it was just one person's art project all right buddy and next you're gonna tell me that lee harvey oswald acted alone tinker taylor soldier spy
My friend Steve could conceptualize an art project of this scale, and he definitely has the skills to compose the digital images that would become the composites. Far, he could break the images down back to the individual frames and do some simple audio distortion effects. Writing the scripts to automate the upload process for the thousands of videos would fall on me. I also like money, so if I could slip something malicious in to reverse engineer YouTube's internal processes and sell that to the highest bidder, you best believe I would. I mean, no, definitely not. Why would don't do anything like that? <laughs> Kevin, you're gonna get my YouTube channel banned. And because this would be set up on multiple dedicated computers running 24-7, my brother would inevitably sneak in and try to weaponize the whole thing just for laughs. This is a guy whose favorite type of jokes are puns, not because they're funny, but because the joke is how angry they make other people. This is my personal theory, and not one that I've really seen discussed. The problem with any of the individual theories is that none of them quite explain everything. The idea of it just being an art project comes closest, but even then, it isn't perfect. Nevertheless, I don't see any reason why it has to be any single theory. This project was a massive undertaking that definitely required more than one dedicated computer and almost definitely required more than one person. I suspect there was a singular artist with a singular vision, a series of YouTube videos each representing one pixel of a large piece of digital art waiting for someone to combine them. The project grew to include more than one image, some encoding across multiple videos and others in long standalone videos. I believe this was the artist's vision, but he needed one or more people to help automate the complex computer stuff that would take an individual person doing it decades. These recruits saw potential in what was being created and decided to hijack the project to perform a series of penetration tests. Ah, uh, really? That the artist just happens? Why wouldn't these people who want to do penetration tests do the penetration test separately? This could have happened with or without the artist's knowledge or permission, and the fact that it was ultimately multiple people working towards multiple different end goals is why finding a singular purpose for unfavorable semicircles so difficult. Or maybe I'm wrong, and it really is just one person's art project, but it's still not aliens. I want it to be the penetration test thing. That's by far the most interesting one. But I think it could just be some sort of failed art project. I think Kevin's probably right. It's probably the boring one. I don't. I mean, Kevin. I don't think it's the combination of two. Wrap up. Can you believe the average YouTube video about unfavorable semicircle is about ten minutes long? It's like they're not even trying to investigate. All right, Kevin. <laughs> don't throw too much shade. Still, when it came time to explore the internet's favorite collection of bleeps and bloops surrounded by flashing lights, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. The mystery rivals the complexity of Cicada 3301, but without any of the helpful narration and clues. Maybe there is a simple answer waiting to be found, a composite image that explains everything in great detail. Even if that were true, the video with that answer could have 80,000 other videos queued up in front of it for analysis. I don't think this mystery is going to remain unsolved forever, but unless the creator finds comes forward to lend a helping hand, there could easily be a decade of work left to decode it all. And that is where we end today's episode of Decoding the Unknown. We didn't really successfully decode this one, did we? But maybe it will be done in the future. Anyway, I've been Simon. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, please, if you're listening to it, do leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, hello there. Please hit the like button. Make sure you're subscribed. Leave a comment if you fancy it. And I'll see you next time.